It was David who said in Psalms 118 and the verses 24, This is the day that the Lord hath made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We're thankful to God for another blessed opportunity for us to be here this Lord's Day. And I'm just peacock proud to be in the presence of my brethren this morning to praise God's holy name. We're going to have a couple of songs, a song or two, and, and uh, we're going to ask Brother Bolden to come on and give us a shouting song and let us crank it up this morning. We're just thankful that you're with us this morning. We're thankful to God that you have come this morning for no other reason than to worship God and worship him in spirit and in truth. Let us open with an invocation. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, and we thank you for the opportunity for us to come and to worship you. We pray that your hand will be upon us this, this morning. We pray that all that we say and all that we do will be according to your will. We're thankful for our innermost blessings, Father, those that we take for granted and those who are less fortunate than we are. Father, we're thankful for this country. We're thankful for the church. And we pray that our worship today will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Bo. Our hymn of praise before scripture and prayer is hymn number 26, An Empty Mansion. Hymn number 26. Here I labor and pause and I look for a home, uh, just a humble above among men. A uh, while in him, the no mansion is waiting for me, and a gem to voice pleading, come in. There's a man shall now empty just <coughs> for me. He has the end of life trouble some way. How many friends and dear loved ones will welcome me there uh, near the door of that mansion someday. He ever thankful am I that my Savior, Lord, promise us <coughs> where we read. Nothing more could I ask than a mansion above, there to live with the saved and the blessed. There's a mansion now empty just waiting for me, and the end of life trouble. Some way, many days and dear loved ones will welcome me there. And you know of that man someday when my lips are calling heaven did below, and my hand shall lie folded in rest. I'll exchange this old home for a mansion of death, and invite the archangel as gam. There's a man empty just waiting for me. He has the end of life humble some way. Many friends and dear loved ones will well. 
Our scripture reading can be found in the book of Colossians, Colossians, third chapter, beginning at the 18th verse. Colossians 3 and 18. The Christian home. I will be reading from the New King James Version. And it reads, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting unto the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing to the Lord. And fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. And may we receive a blessing from God, holy and righteous name. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Father God, we thank you again, Father, for allowing us to assemble ourselves here this evening to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father God, we ask that you continue to bless Liberty City Church of Christ, Father. And Father God, we pray for those that are unfortunate. We pray for those sick ones among us. We pray for the ones that at home, hospital, nursing home, or wherever they might be that stands in the need of prayer. And Father God, we thank you for our ministers, our song leaders, and the leadership of this congregation. Father God, we just can't thank you enough for all that you have done and all that you're doing. And Father God, we pray for those on the highway and byway. Father, we ask that you keep harms out of their way. And Father God, we pray for the homeless. We pray for those that are unfortunate. And Father God, we pray for those that was affected by the coronavirus, Father. And Father, we ask that you bring them back to their most wanted need. And Father God, we give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. And we give you all the praise. And we thank you, Father, for being our Father and letting us be your children. And these prayers we ask. In Jesus' name, and all who love the Lord say it, amen, amen. I'm going to praise before our minister come before us, hymn number 68. Hymn number 68. Because he lives. God sent his son. They call him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, oh, I can face my heart Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I And life is worth the living just because he lived. And then one day I'll cross the river, I'll find life's fire in a war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, 
praises the Lord of glory, and I know he lives, because he lives, yes, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all the rest go, because I know Holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives, because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone. Holds a future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Let the church say amen. Let the church say hallelujah. Let the church say praise the Lord. Come on, brethren. I know you can do. Let the church say praise the Lord. All right, well, I'm so thankful to God for his blessedness this morning, and we're thankful to God for you who are out there in our listening audience. You could have been anywhere today, but we're thankful to God that you chose to come by the Liberty City Church of Christ. We're hoping and trusting that you've had a great week this week. Once again, God in his infinite love and his immaculate mercy, his inexhaustible grace, he's blessed us one more time. And giving us permission to praise and giving us a privilege to pray and giving us a prerogative uh, to pamper us as his beloved children. We bring you greetings from the Poke and Beans down here at the Liberty City Church of Christ. And we hope that your week has been an uneventful one negatively. But we hope that you've allowed God to use your talents and your ministry to bless somebody along the way. A word of thanks this morning goes out to the angel of the house of the Glass City Church of Christ there in the great city of Toledo, Ohio, Brother Robert Burke, who allowed us to go and to be a part of their services this week, and we were blessed on Tuesday to be down there in the great city of Toledo, Ohio. We're so thankful to God that we were able to get down there and fellowship with them and do their devotional. We were also glad that we were able to go by uh, the Lordy Church of Christ on, two, on Wednesday, rather, Wednesday night. And we were able to go to the Lordy Church of Christ and be able to be a part of their devotional and services. And we're thankful for these two congregations for inviting us to be a part of them virtually this week. A word of thanks also to our brethren who came out this afternoon, some on a short notice, but they came anyhow to praise God this morning and to be a part of this service th today. We're hoping that today that you have your Bibles ready. We pray that you have paper or pencil ready because thoughts are like birds. They'll fly away. And a short pencil is better than a long memory any day. And we're thankful to God for all that he has done. Also, because of the brevity of time this morning, we are planning to go to the Brownsville Church of Christ to be a part of their worship this morning. We've been asked to say a word from the Lord. And I'm thankful to God for that. And then immediately after, if the Lord says so, I'm going to try to scoop up my girlfriend, my, the ice in between my Oreo, my honey bunch, uh, my sugar dumpling. Amen. Uh, she's the brick house. I'm the brick mason. Amen. And uh, we hope to God that we'll be able to travel up and down the road to get her. And then on Tuesday, I'm to be in Oklahoma City to the Spencer Church of Christ. 
uh, to do a funeral, to be there at a funeral, and I'm, I'm praying to God that we will have a safe passage. My prayers are also with our minister emeritus, Dr. Freeman T. Weiss, God's preacher. Uh, he's away in Houston doing a marriage ceremony this week, and we pray to God that God will use him real well for that ceremony. God bless your brother White. So pray God you'll have a safe trip back. Again, for emphasis sake, I want you to turn to Colossians, the third chapter, beginning at verses number 18 through verses number 21. It's so good to be back at the building today. I, I just feel like shouting. Amen. <laughs> Amen. The Bible says, wives, submit yourselves to your husband, for this is fitting to those who belong to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly or be bitter toward them. Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. And fathers, do not aggravate or provoke your children to wrath. But they will be discouraged. I want to thank those brethren who sang and prayed and gave scripture this morning. Everything has been decently and in order thus far. My brother Harold Harrell, rather, Hinton is dealing with a series of studies called the Kingdom Marriage and Kingdom Family. And he told me to say a word, and I hope I don't mess up that series this morning because I know he's doing a marvelous job. But I came by to ask a question, is there any logos from the Holy Ghost? Is there any word from the Lord? We want to briefly and prayerfully, concisely look at one of God's greatest institutions called the family this morning. Because the kingdom, the family of God, has a viewpoint that is biblical, one that we need to practice, one that is practical, and one that we can do according to the will of God. You know, every time I look at this subject called family, I just get excited. I just get enamored because there is much exhaustive information in the Bible about your family. There is much that we need to know because this is one of God's favorite topics, the family. And therefore, much has been said, much has been applied, much has been misapplied, much has been practiced. Much has been negatively and positively done to this subject, family. Let me say from the outset that I'm privileged by God to be blessed with the family. Amen. Amen. And I've been blessed to even have a degree in marriage and family therapy. But the Lord knows I don't claim to be an expert on the family. I don't claim to be a hot shot or an ace on this subject called family. But there are some things I do know. I do know that God has blessed me with a beautiful wife and three talented daughters. I, I do know that I have a beautiful son-in-law and, and three awesome grandsons. And, and I do know that I have a God-fearing mother-in-law and godly parents that, that tried to rear me up. And if my wife were here this morning, she would tell you that she married a perfect man and he has yet to make a mistake. Amen. I'm trying to wake y'all up this morning. I saw a sign one day, a sign that said, Girlfriend, if you're looking for a man that is keenly responsible, if you're looking for a man that's nice and, and kind, if you're looking for a man that's always respectful and courteous, if you're looking for a man who's loving and caring and faithful and good-looking and honest and cool and trustworthy and rich, if you're looking for that man, just be very patient. Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> I got news for you. We got some work to do when it comes to this subject called family. This morning, I am cautiously reporting that the family, the home, is under construction for some. For others, their homes are being demolished. For others, it is in a remodeling stage. Notice, I did not say the house. I said the home. Because there is a stark difference between the church and the building. And there is a stark difference between the house and a home. A house is just living quarters. But a godly home is an institution. The house is just a building. But the home is a life laboratory. The house 
is a modern dwelling place of many rooms, but a home has many memories. A house has been designed by an earthly architect, but a godly home has been built by God. A house has economic status, but a home, a godly home, must have a divine bank account. A house has family members, but a home has family relationships. A house is brick and mortar, but a home is comfort and safety. A house has tables and chairs, but a home has value, stability, and structure. A house has a flat screen and a laptop, but a home is down to earth, caring and concerning for one another. There's a difference between a house and a home. Oh, I could go on and on, but I pray you get my drift. Because millions today are looking for a palatial mansion. They're looking for a house, but what they really need is a godly home. You can have a $5,000 house, but be spiritually bankrupt in a $5 million home. Let me stop meddling, because y'all ain't saying amen. But the question and the consideration is, if we were to put a listening device in your home, and some cameras secretly all over your home, what would we see? What would people see? What would they hear? Don't y'all answer. Don't y'all answer. What, what would they see? Y'all done got quiet on me, brethren. The good news is, is that we have a godly project manager that's second to none. No, it's not Bob Vila who constructed this old house it's not Lenar Homes, which has contracts, but they're not in the running. It's not Rutland Homes, which is a good company. They're not even in the arena. But the psalmist says in Psalms 127, verses 1 through 5, that except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waked but in vain. What are you saying, David? David said, unfortunately, if the Lord has not built your house, there is no need in you even building it. Your labor is in vain. And if the Lord is not keeping our cities, is not securing our cities, is not watching over our cities, then we can wake in vain. God not only has a plan, but he has the best plan for the home. He has the greatest policies out there for the family. Our God is a God of order. He's a God of pattern. He's a God who has exercised his kingdom plan. And so for a short while this morning, we want to deal with the subject, a royal plan for the kingdom of God. A royal plan for God's kingdom this morning. Because he's given us a royal plan. And if we just take note of this royal plan, everything going to be all right. Everything going to be okay, church. You know, when you go to Genesis, get your Bibles. Now, I'll go to Genesis chapter 1. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit began to create something from nothing. And from nothing, they created everything. The Trinity God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, breathe out some triplets. First of all, they breathe out let. And then he caught up with his riding partner, B. And then he caught up with his traveling companion, was. Let, B, and was went all over the place and began to construct a universe. From nothing, God made something. And then when you get down to verse number 26, the Bible says that God said, let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. And God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, the Bible says, created he male and female. That is Adam and Eve. Not Eve and Evelyn. Not Steve and Frank. Hey, Amen. I ain't talking about you, Frank. But God, 
created man and woman. And then when you get down to verse number 28, I believe the Bible says, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth. Subdue the earth. Have dominion over the fish, over the sea, over the fowls of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And this triune God created with a crescendo all that is created. Oh, I wish I had time to stay right there, but we, we got to hurry up. It is amazing how doctors, how psychologists, how sociologists, how psychiatrists, how scientists, how biologists have yet to tap into all of the intricacies, all of the unique avenues that have been designed by God Almighty. Man is a triune being. Man consists of body, soul, and spirit. The soul, from the Greek word suke, nephesh, is the intellect, the memory, the personality. The spirit, from the Greek word pneuma, which means breathe, ruha, God breathe, is the eternal presence of man. Both like the wind, we breathe like God did. All animals that have a vertebrae, all mammals, fish have to breathe, but they use their gills. And we breathe, man breathes like God did. The soul, the body, the spirit are all over the Bible. When you get to first Thessalonians, the fifth chapter in the verse number 23. The Bible says, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray that the God, the Holy Spirit, the soul, and the body be preserved blameless to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you drop down to Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter, and the verse is number 7. The Bible says, then shall the dust return to the earth that was, and the spirit shall return to the God that gave it. When you look at Hebrews 4 and the verse preached off, verse number 12, the Bible says, for the word of God is quick and powerful. Sharpening any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing of sons of soul, spirit, joint, and marrow, and the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Genesis 2 and the verse 7, God said, and the Lord said, he formed God, he formed man rather from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils, and man became a living soul. There's body, soul, and spirit all over the Bible. And when God created us, he created us in his own image. Then when you jump from chapter 1 of Genesis, jump over to chapter 2 and the verses number 5. The Bible says, now every plant in the field before him that was on the earth, every herb in the field was before him grew. And the Lord God had not caused for it to rain on the earth, but there was not a man to till the ground. Now we're going to come back to that because there's some meat in there. And then he says in verse number 6, but God, he went up in the midst of the earth. He watered the whole face of the ground, and the Lord said that he formed man from the dust of the ground. And then he breathed into his nostrils, and man became a living soul. Then when you drop down to verse number 15, the Bible says, And the Lord God took that man, he put him in a garden, he took him there to dress it, to keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou shalt freely eat, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat thereof. For the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord said unto him, It's not good that man should be alone. I'll make you a help me. Praise God. I'll make you a help me. And out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field. He formed every fowl of the air. He brought them to Adam. And he said, Adam, what you going to call him? And Adam said, he called him some of everything. Every creature a name thereof. God made it just like he wanted so Adam called the cattle. He said, come on over here, cattle. He called the birds. He said, I'm calling you birds. He called those, and then all of a sudden, something happened. God put Adam in a deep sleep. The first surgery, the first anesthesiologist was God. He put man asleep, and then he slept, and then he went over to his side. He pulled out an old reel. Somebody said he didn't go to his feet. Because he didn't want man to walk on the woman. He, he didn't go to his head. Because he didn't want him to knock her out. But he went to his side. 
so that they can walk side <laughs> by, y'all, y'all got it. And then he pulled a rib out the side and, and out of that rib, he found this woman. He made a woe man, a woe after man, a, a man. And Adam looked at it. He said, mm, you so look good. But this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Girl, you so look good to me. But then after that, the Bible lets us know after he said that, he made a law. Verse number 24, he says, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they both were naked. They were not ashamed, for the man and the wife were together. And then, from chapter 2, we go to, y'all stay with me now, we go to chapter 3. And in chapter 3, sin entered into the garden. Verse, oh, I wish I had time. I ain't got time. Verse 14 and 15. Then the curse of sin, the serpent, better known as Satan, beguiled Eve, and the woman had a penalty, drove them out of the garden. Then chapter 4, the family comes in. Now here's where we are tonight. Today, family came in and was introduced with the birth of Cain and Abel. And then in chapter 4, the Bible says he establishes an everlasting paradigm. He established an eternal, thank you my brother, pivotal principles and pattern to keep humanity out of chaos. You see, God created family. Somebody said, well, he put it together so we could fight. No, no. He put the family together to keep us out of chaos. If everybody keeps their roles, if children obey their parents, if husbands love their wives, if wives submit to their husbands, then it'll keep you out of trouble. Hey, amen, Wall. Y'all don't believe that. So therefore, he set up three institutions, church. He set up in the garden three institutions, three divine institutions. Whenever you see an institution, you see one that establishes law, it establishes practice, and it establishes custom. That's what an institution stands for. An entity that establishes law, it establishes practice, and it establishes a custom for us to follow. But whenever the foundations are destroyed, then we're going to be in trouble. The first institution he set up was government. When you go to Genesis 2, back to verses 15 through 17, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden, told him to dress it, be a good gardener, amen? But then I want you to look at verse 16. The Lord God commanded man. First time you see that word, he establishes law between him and man. And he says, of every tree of the garden you can eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat thereof. For the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely, without shadow of a doubt, die. God set up government. And then secondly, God set up another institution. He set up marriage. When you look in verse number 24, Therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, they should become one flesh, marriage. And then, chapter 4, the third institution is, he set up family. Adam and Eve, conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she began to bear his brother, Abel. And Abel was the keeper of the sheep, Cain was the tiller of the ground. Notice now, in this establishment, in this institution, there are some staples of human existence. In Genesis 2, 5, every plant of the field before there was an earth, as he put the earth there, rather, before there was a tiller to the ground, God put plants, but he wouldn't plant them until he got a gardener. Did y'all get that? He says every plant, every herb, before it grew, the Lord had not caused it to rain so it can grow. Because there was not a man to till the ground. After he created a man, everything started growing. And so he put a man there to cultivate the ground. Man had a job. 
I want you to notice this. Man had a job before he got a wife. I think I said something there. I said man had a job. Y'all done got quiet on me. Before he got a wife. <laughs> and then he had responsibility, verse 15. He didn't go to school. But God gave him enough intelligence to name all the animals. And then, verse 16 through 18, he gave all of creation policies and procedures. Now, fasten your seat belts. Get your arms and legs inside of this Christian train. To be honest, when it comes to family, we have not fared so well. Y'all might as well say amen. I'm going to say amen for you. When it comes to this thing called family, we've done everything from turning inside out. Adam and Eve, when they got a family, it wasn't long that sin entered the garden and one of their children became a murderer. When Abraham got a family, he chose two wives and he ended up kicking one out. When Jacob had a family, he had several wives, 12 sons, and they sold one of their brothers into captivity. When David got a family, and after God's own heart, he committed one of the greatest adulterous cover-ups and conspiracies in the scriptures. <laughs> There's a common denominator here, church. I don't know if you see it. That we've all had problems from time to time waiting on God. Isaiah 40, I believe it says, in verse number 31, it says, But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not think. When it comes to our families, if ever there was a time our families need renovation and remodeling, that time is now. Joyful marriages and families are precious like jewels. They are a rare commodity. The wise preacher Solomon said in a long time ago, in Solomon 24, in the verses 3 and 4, Solomon said, now, through wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, a house is established. And by knowledge, all the chambers are filled with precious and pleasant rubies. He used three things there. He says, first of all, if you're going to build a house, build it with wisdom. If you're going to construct a house, build it with understanding. And if you're going to establish your house, make sure you got some knowledge in every room. A house built on wisdom, on common sense, becomes good sense. Uh, we pray to God that wisdom is in your house. Somebody says, well, preacher, how do you get wisdom? I'm so glad you asked. I don't know what to do. Uh, Proverbs 9 and 10, the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of him is holy understanding. We get wisdom by fearing God. In closing. Three quick jots as we close. How do we build the royal family? How do we have kingdom homes? Point number one, you need to consult the king. You need to consult the king's manual. Some people call it the owner's manual. Man, generic, man or woman, needs to develop a relationship with God before they start talking about getting a wife or a husband. Amen? You might be wealthy. You may have a room full of degrees. You may be as creative and as ingenious as Bill Gates. But without a great relationship in life and a great relationship with God, then you need not try to build a home. Before God created Eve, he developed a great relationship with Adam. Before Eve came on the scene, he and God conversated. He and God communicated before he decided to make him a won't man. He was Adam's number one provider. God provided for Adam. He built a relationship. When you go back to Genesis 2, verses 8 and 9, not just any garden, but he made sure Adam had all the tools he needed to be the gardener. He built the best garden. He was the good housekeeper. And then he built him a river. 
with four channels called Eden. And then he gave him water from that river. And I know it had to be good water because God gave it. It had to be pure water. And then he gave Adam bling, bling, verse number 12. He gave Adam some gold. He gave Adam bedellum, cologne. Read your Bible. He gave Adam some onyx. He wanted him comfortable emotionally, psychologically, socially. And then not only was he a provider, God developed his relationship by becoming a good communicator. God talked to Adam. Let me tell you something. Family don't ever play the silent treatment. It's a dangerous game that you play. It's a psychological game that you play. Even when Adam got in trouble and Eve got in trouble, God communicated with Adam and Eve. And then in developing that relationship, he set boundaries. When you look in verse number 16 and 17, he says, Adam, let me tell you something. You can eat of every tree you want to eat. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil, don't touch it. Communication. Provider. Boundaries. Before he gave him a woman, before he gave him a family, he developed a relationship. And then secondly, in closing, not only must we check the king's manual, consult the king's manual, Point number two, you need to check the king's mandate. What is the king's mandate? The king's mandate is one man for one woman. Y'all done got quiet on me. Now, brother, I know you got your black books. I know you got a honey in every corner, a sugar in every container. But God set it up one man for one woman. Adam said, this is bone of my bone, Genesis 2, 23, flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman. God told him to leave and cleave. Amen. When a man leaves this owner's mandate, then the family is in trouble. The church is in trouble. The community is in trouble. Y'all done got quiet on me, brother. I ain't mad at you, but I add more to it before I take it back. Man was created in the image of Almighty God. One man, one woman shows unity. It shows submission. It shows order. First Corinthians 11 and the verses 3. The Bible says, now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Love. First John 4 and the verses 8 came from God. And then lastly, confide in the king's masterpiece. What is the king's masterpiece? It is role recognition. Recognize that you are and who you are. Recognize whose you are. Wives have a responsibility of submitting to their husbands. The model of submission goes way back in the Bible. Those who do not want to submit, Romans 8 and the verses 7, says the sinful mind is hostile to God because it does not submit to the law of Almighty God. And then husbands are to love their wives, to be real with their wives. Amen? And then children are to obey their parents. Oh, this may not be popular preaching, but I got news for you. When it comes to obedience and children to their parents, God gives the analogy of a slave to his master, Colossians 3 and the verses 22. He gives that analogy. Why? Because a child that won't respect their parents will not respect authority. The Bible lets us know in Romans 13, 1 and 2, that every power there is has been submitted by God. And there are some higher powers, but these powers have been ordained government by God. Wherefore, therefore, he that resisted the power is resisting the ordinance of God. Are you out there today? Are you a guilty distance from God? Is your family in shambles? Go back to the owner's manual. God's got a plan for you and your family. We pray to God today that we have given you something that you can use, something that will encourage your heart.
If you're here today, we pray that if you're out there in our listening audience, that if you need us to consult with you further about your soul salvation, understand God had but one son, and he was a preacher. He established a way to heaven through the church. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. After you've heard the word of God, you must have faith to believe, Romans 10, 9, Romans 14, and the verse 11. And then be buried in the grave called baptism. Uh, after you have submitted to confession and after you've repented of your sins, we pray that you'll come. We pray that you'll be obe obedient. Why, preacher? Because tomorrow is not promised. Tomorrow belongs to God. And if we go tomorrow facing God in anger, then heaven will not be your home. You can give us a call on our phone line, 305-836-4555. Or just go to our website. Go to our contact page. Drop it down. Give us a line. Let us know your request. You don't have to be here in the building in order to obey the gospel. We can get to you virtually, and then we can minister you physically and bring you to Jesus. Go to our website, lccmiami.org, and let us come to your aid. We pray to God that you'll respond today as we sing a song of encouragement. Oh, what wondrous love I see freely shown for you and me by the one who did a just to show his matchless grace, Jesus suffered for the race. Hey, hey, alone. Oh, what love, matchless love. Oh, what love for me was shown. Yes, forever I will be for the love he gave to me. When he suffered all alone. Let's uh, prepare our hearts for tithes and communion. All tithes, you can bring it to the building, or you can mail it, or you can do it online. At what time uh, do they come? Between 12 to 2. I'll be reading the scripture concerning the communion from the first Corinthians chapters 11, verse 23 through 29. And it reads, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as, all, for as often as ye eat this bread and ye drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. But let a man examine himself. So let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup unworthily, so he eating and drinking damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us pray. Oh, Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share in the communion, the, the, the cup, which is the blood of the body, the bread, which is the body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
God for most holy and well enough to call this morning and come and pray with us. Let us pray with us and ask for his blessing this morning. Thank you for allowing us into the church and all that other stuff too. Thank you for allowing us to be able to end this afternoon so we can be served. Let's just search.